Congresses Excellent Conference. Um, what is uh, this research paper about? In this paper, um, we employ a novel and comprehensive data set of firm-specific newspaper coverage in the New York Times to analyze the relation between firm visibility and stock returns. <coughs> let's start with an example to motivate um, our research question. So let's take a look at Pfizer's media coverage in the New York Times in the year 2011. How many newspaper articles had Pfizer in that year? So there was a first article on January 2nd um, that reported about coupons and uh, patients could use these coupons to purchase drugs, for example, Pfizer's Lipitor drug at a large discount, for example, in this drug for $4 a month. But in the end, these uh, coupons could have negative consequences for the insurers. Two days later, there was another article about Pfizer um, reporting on a tax increase in Japan, where the government raised the taxes on tobacco. So many Japanese people decided that they wanted to quit smoking and ask for a specific drug by Pfizer. Unfortunately, Pfizer did not anticipate this additional demand, and so Pfizer ran out of stock, and that resulted in a missed opportunity. Then there are more articles, just to give you another example. The 11th article in that year was an article about Pfizer's earnings announcement. Had the headline, weak earnings deflate Wall Street rally. After two weeks of strong earnings pumped up the market, weak results from the drug maker Pfizer and others deflated a broad, broad earnings rally. Over the entire year, Pfizer had 31 articles uh, in total. Is this a lot of newspaper coverage? Is this a high visible firm? Or is it a little newspaper coverage, a less visible firm? So let's take a look at the comparable firm. Here I picked Alert Incorporated. It's also a pharmaceutical company. It's also a large cap stock. Both companies, Pfizer and Allergan, are members of the S&P 500 index. So these firms should be comparable, but in terms of their newspaper coverage, it looks quite different. So while Pfizer had 31 articles, Allergan only had a single article in the New York Times in that year. It was an article about a new band device that was approved by the FDA for less obese people. And in this paper, we asked the question, does this difference in visibility, Pfizer being a highly visible firm <coughs> and Alert being a firm with a low visibility, has any relation to financial markets, in particular, any relation to stock returns? You probably wonder in this example, was the year 2011 kind of a a uh, special year. No, it was not. For example, in 2012, Pfizer had 34 articles and I learned only one article. So this difference in visibility seems to be quite persistent. Why would you expect to be uh, a relation? We expect that more visible firms have higher stock returns for two reasons. The first reason is that media coverage can serve as a substitute for product market advertising. If a firm gets a lot of media coverage, then this can help to attract consumers to a firm's products, and so consumers become aware of their products and consider buying these products. Furthermore, if the newspaper coverage is positive, then this will also help to improve consumers' attitude towards a firm's product. The second channel we have in mind is a monitoring channel, so a lot of media coverage helps to monitor corrupt or inefficient managerial behavior. There is um, one example, um, a study by uh, Luigi Singales that looks at corporate governance violation in Russia, and they find that um, if a firm commits corporate governance violations and the international press jumps on it, then they are more likely to revert these corporate governance violations. If you combine the positive advertising channel and the monitoring channel, you would expect that visibility should be positively related to firm performance. They get higher cash flows and they are managed more efficiently. Our empirical evidence is in line with these hypotheses and as we find a positive relation between visibility and stock returns. Where does our evidence come from? We employ a novel and comprehensive data set of firm-specific New York Times coverage. 
We include all ordinary shares listed on the three major exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, and the NASDAQ. So in total, we have about 23,500 stocks over our sample period from 1926 to 2014. Furthermore, from a methodological point of view, we carefully control for the determinants of media coverage. For example, it's clear that large firms like Pfizer will have more media coverage than small firms like a biotech startup, and this has to be taken into account in, a, in the empirical analysis. Furthermore, um, we analyze the two channels we have in mind, the advertising channel and the governance channel in more detail. Let's talk a bit more about the data set we use. The New York Times, we employ two different newspaper data sets. The first data set comes from New York Times Chronicle. This database is based on the historical archive of the New York Times, and it gives you the annual number of newspaper articles published about a firm in the New York Times, going back to 1851. This database is freely available in the internet at nytlabs.com slash project slash chronicle.html. And it has become available quite recently uh, in summer 2014. Is the uh, New York Times important <coughs> for financial markets? Yes, um, it's one of the leading US newspapers. Uh, I think it long, has long been the third largest in terms of circulation. During the more recent period, I think it became even the second largest. It has a large business section, so it has the second highest firm coverage after the Wall Street Journal. And it has been used in previous papers, for example, in Diego's 2013 JF paper. Let me show you a screenshot of this database. So here I, you see the um, newspaper coverage of Chrysler and General Motors um, according to this New York Times Chronicle database. You see that the two firms uh, had no coverage um, before uh, the early 20th century when they were created, and then they are regularly featured in the news. The overall pattern, I think, makes a lot of sense. So you see the spike in 2008 and 2009 when the uh, US um, car manufacturers had to be bailed out by the US government. The spike before in 79 refers to the second oil crisis, so I think this overall pattern makes a lot of sense. In this paper, we are less interested in the year-to-year -year changes in newspaper coverage, so for, we are not interested in the spikes. We are more interested in the persistent level of visibility. And in this example, you see that General Motors has on average a higher visibility than uh, Chrysler as it is persistently uh, more covered in the New York Times than Chrysler. Our alternative newspaper data set comes from LexisNexis. Here we have um, four national newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and USO Today. Um, the sample starts a bit later in the 1970s, and it ends in 2013. This data set has two additional advantages. The first is that LexisNexis provides a relevant score that tells you whether the article is really about the firm or whether the firm is only mentioned as a side remark. And here we include all articles with a relevant score of 80 and more, which indicates that the article contains a major reference to the company. Another advantage is that here we have the full text articles available, so we can also analyze the tone of the article and distinguish between good news and bad news. For the New York Times Chronicle database, we only have the number of articles. So let's move on to the empirical results. So what you would typically do is you would sort stocks based on the variable of interest, in this case by media coverage, into let's say five portfolios and then analyze the firm's subsequent stock returns. When you do this sorting exercise based on raw media coverage, raw media coverage means just the number of articles about a firm in year T, you get the following picture. So by construction, the uh, number of articles increases um, from portfolio one to portfolio five. However, the firms in portfolio five are quite different from the firms in portfolio one. When you look at the size of these firms, 
you see that the firms in portfolio five are much larger. Um, so the um, low coverage firms are on average from the third size D side, while the stocks from the portfolio five, the high coverage firms are on average from the sixth size D side. To give you an idea here, I picked two examples. A low coverage firm would be um, Depot Mate Inc. It's in, from the second uh, NYSE size D side, has a market cap of about 300 million in 2011. And you would compare this firm to Pfizer from the 10th NYSE size D side with a market cap of 166 billion. So Pfizer is more than 500 times larger than this other firm. So it, I think it's quite intuitive that this is not a fair comparison. In particular, um, sizes. The size sort is problematic because we know from the work by Pharma and French that size is also related to stock returns. Smaller firms earn higher returns than large firms. So not controlling for the size effect would lead to the wrong conclusion that no coverage stocks have higher returns. So it's important to control for the differences in firm characteristics and for the determinants of newspaper coverage. We do that by using a regression approach. So each year we regress the number of articles on firm size and a bunch of other firm characteristics and then use the residual from this regression as a size adjusted um, media coverage measure. When, when we do that, um, we get um, a better um, comparability across the five portfolios. So these Portfolios are formed by residual media coverage. You can think of that as size-adjusted media coverage. And you now see that the number of articles is still increasing uh, from portfolio one to portfolio five. But now the size of the firms is much better comparable across the five portfolios. Now you can have a fair comparison. In this case, Allergan from the 10th NYSE size desire S&P 500 member to Pfizer also from the 10th NYSE size D side. So now let's move on to the results. What is the relation between a firm's media coverage, a firm's visibility, and stock returns? So we sort st stocks based on their residual media coverage in year T and then look at the returns over the subsequent three years. You see that the low coverage returns have, uh, low coverage stocks have a return of 13.9% in year T plus one, while the high coverage stocks have a return of 16.5% in year T plus one. And the returns monotonically increase from low coverage to high coverage stocks. This difference of 2.6% uh, per annum is highly statistically significant with a T-set of 3.56 and also economically meaningful. Over the next three years, um, you get a very similar picture high coverage stocks have higher returns than low coverage stocks. When you control for systematic risk factors, for example, in ZCAP-M or in other uh, factor models, the results are very similar. So systematic risk factors cannot explain the difference in returns between visible firms and less visible firms. So we conclude that firm visibility is positively related to future stock returns. You may argue that these 2.6% per year are not so large, so perhaps it's not economically important. And to convince you that, is, that it is economically important, I would like to show you the sharp ratio of different investment strategies. So if you would exploit this visibility effect, you would buy the stocks from portfolio five, the high coverage firms, and sell short the stocks from portfolio one. When you do that, you would end up with a sharp ratio of 0.47. This is uh, the blue bar. And if you compare that to the sharp ratio of the market, then you see uh, that it is larger, 0.47 compared to 0.4. And um, just as a comparison, I've plotted three other sharp ratios, small minus big, um, value minus growth and momentum. And you see that the sharp ratio of a visibility strategy is even quite close to the sharp ratio of momentum, which is considered uh, one of the major return anomalies. So this difference in returns is economically important. Given that we have this long sample period of 90 years, we can look at different sub-periods. 
If we look at the first sub period from 1928 to 1974, we find that visible firms have higher returns than uh, firms with low visibility. Here the return difference ranges from 2.2% to 2.7%. For the later period from 75 to 2014, the results are a bit weaker, 1.3 to 2.3%. For the later period, we can also use our second data sets and it includes the four national newspapers, includes the relevance score, and using uh, this data set we get stronger results, uh, which I think you would expect because the LexisNexis data is a better um, visibility proxy as it contains um, less noise. Um, as we've um, heard before, the media landscape has changed during the recent years. Online media becomes increasingly important. So you may wonder, is the visibility effect still um, present today? Is the visibility still positively related to stock returns? And here we employ an, an, an additional visibility proxy based on internet searches. And when we do that, we still can confirm the positive relation between visibility and stock returns. Using internet searches, we find that visible stocks have about 7% higher returns than uh, less visible firms. So we conclude that there is a robust and po uh, positive relation between firm visibility and stock returns. Um, let's briefly talk about alternative ex explanations. There are, uh, these are only some of the explanations we, uh, we look at in our paper. Could it be that this is driven by industries? For example, um, are there some industries that are more visible than others? And does this explain our results? No, it's not the case. If we repeat our analysis within industries, we get the same results. Could it be that there are other information intermediaries like analysts that drive our effects? This is also not the case. You might be familiar with Merton's 1987 investor recognition model. This does also um, not explain our findings, neither does ownership, ownership structure or illiquidity. So hopefully I could convince you that there is a positive relation between visibility and stock returns. So in the second part of my presentation, I would like to talk a bit more about the two channels we have in mind, the advertising channel and the monitoring channel. And again, I would like to start with a motivating example. Um, Here's an article that nicely illustrates the idea of the advertising channel. This was an article um, published about Apple in 2007. Apple, hoping for another iPod, introduces innovative cell phone. With charismatic showmanship, Stephen Jobs introduced Apple's long-awaited entry into the cell phone world Tuesday, pronouncing it an achievement on par with Macintosh and the iPod. But it was the ability to fuss those elements with a rough of innovations and Apple's distinctive design sense that had the crowd here buzzing. So this nicely illustrates that such articles can attract consumers' attention um, towards the firm's product, and this article also is quite positive, so consumers will get a positive attitude towards the firm's product. Another example um, for Amazon, this article first discusses Amazon's quarterly earnings, and then talks about um, new products um, introduced by Amazon. One um, product here is Dash, um, events that you can use to reorder household items from toilet paper to guitar strings. The video commercial for Dash shows children restocking their house. And on Wednesday, Amazon introduced Prime, Prime Pantry, a grocery delivery service for its Prime brokers and Prime customers. So again, this is an example where um, the readers of the newspaper learn about a firm's products, which um, serves as free advertising. Let me show you um, examples for the monitoring channel. Here is an article about American Apparel. Um, it's about uh, the founder of American Apparel who was fired um, because of um, sexual harassment or accusations of sexual harassment. Um, and inappropriate behavior <coughs> with female employees. And um, the article concludes that some of um, the CEOs and founders who misbehave are fired quickly when investors and boards are alerted. Um, this nicely highlights 
the role of visibility in this case when the press reports about such corporate governance violations, such bad behavior, then um, there are actions taken um, to stop these um, inefficient um, and inappropriate behavior. Uh, second example is about Yahoo's former number two, um, who was fired in January um, and what was paid handsomely for his largely unsuccessful effort to turn around the company's flagging advertising business. And um, he got a diamond crusted golden parachute that was quite valuable. Um, however, this uh, large compensation was not driven by um, the work of um, the executive, but was driven by the rising value of Yahoo's investment in Alibaba. And uh, the last sentence indicates that the company would um, respond to the um, public pressure and nominate three new board members. So how can we test this empirically? You would expect that positive media coverage probably refers to the advertising channel and negative media coverage refers to the monitoring channel. So as a next step, we take article tone into account. Here, um, we follow the approach we have seen in the previous presentations. We use the dictionary by um, Tim Luckman and Bill McDonald. So we count the number of negative words for each article and divide by the total number of words to get a negativity score. Then we sort stocks based into three groups based on their article tone. And then within each group, negative, neutral, and positive, we sort stocks based on their residual coverage and look at the return difference between high coverage firms and low coverage firms. We find that uh, in year T plus one, that uh, high coverage firms have higher returns than low coverage firms for all three groups. Uh, for after negative news, this difference amounts to 3.17%. After positive news, um, this difference is uh, the largest and amounts to 3.66%. And we interpret this as evidence that good news um, is in line with the advertising channel and bad news is in line with the government channel. As an additional analysis, we um, run regressions. So to um, pinpoint the advertising channel, we look at a firm's sales growth over the next three years, and we find that firms that are more visible have stronger sales growth over the next three years, indicating that media coverage serve, serves as a substitute for product market advertising or as free additional advertising. Regarding the monitoring channel, we rely on the entrenchment index developed by Babchuk et al. This index consists of six pro corporate governance provisions. For example, one of the provisions are whether the executives have golden parachutes, like in the Yahoo example, and we find that a higher visibility is related to future improvements in corporate governance. So this is also in line with our expectations. Taken together, these results uh, suggest that the firms, the visible firms should become more profitable in, in the future. So as a next step, we analyze the relation between media coverage and profitability. And we find that more visible firms have stronger gross profitability growth and stronger operating profitability growth. If you compare the stocks from with the 10% highest visibility to the stocks with the 10% lowest visibility, you find a difference in terms of um, gross profitability growth of four percentage points for operating profitability growth. The difference is a bit smaller and amounts to 3.8 percentage points. So we conclude that more visible firms become more profitable over the next three years. Now, you would expect if markets are efficient and investors were aware of the positive effects of visibility, you should find, we should find that uh, visible firms have higher stock prices already today and not have higher returns in the future. So we suggest that there is some mispricing going on and to provide some evidence in this direction, we look at the returns in the earnings announcement market. The idea is at the earnings announcement, investors learn about a firm's profitability 
and if they are um, surprised by the profitability of uh, the visible firms, we should find a large visibility premium in earnings announcement months. And this is actually what we do. So the return difference between visible firms and uh, firms with a high visibility and firms with a low visibility mm -hmm. is only 12 basis points in non-earnings announcement month. In month with a quarterly earnings announcement, it amounts to um, 13 basis points, so it's more than twice as large. And in the month of an annual earnings announcement, the difference amounts to even uh, 90 basis points. And I think this indicates that investors do not price the benefits of visibility adequately. So let me conclude. We find that there is a positive relation between visibility and future stock returns. Visibility is an inadequately priced, um, valuable advertising and monitoring tool. Um, high coverage firms exhibit higher sales growth and improvements in corporate governance, thereby having higher profitability growth in the future. And the visibility premium is um, particularly uh, realized in the times of earnings announcement. So this suggests that there is a positive role of the media as a watchdog for managerial behavior. We find that for corporations, but there may be other contexts where visibility is valuable, for example, in professional sports or in politics. So maybe we should adopt policies that increase visibility, in particular for contexts where there are risks of bad governance. And visibility is a current topic. So when you go to the Times Square, you see that um, the truth is more important now than ever. So thank you very much for your attention.